Hi, today we're going to invite uh, some to you to something to talk about here at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. And it is our pleasure and delight to invite David S. Harrison back for, I think your fourth time now. So uh, he, uh, David is a, a senior lecturer emeritus at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. And good morning, David. Um, so what we have been doing, I think uh, that we've all enjoyed is taking these monthly opportunities to weigh in with each other on what's happening politically. Of course, when we started, it was around the time the, of the election. So that was a freighted and waited time. When I started with you folks, I was assuming that it was a nonpartisan uh, audience and that we would have uh, people on this line who were who were uh, earnest supporters of, of, of the then presidents. And it turned out that everybody we had was not. Um, I do want to say that as I say what I'm gonna say today, um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to say it in a modestly partisan way, but I honor the questions or thoughts or concerns of anybody who might feel differently, I think. It's good for the, this island to have multiple voices. I want to talk about three things. And as I told Karen, I'm going to stop after about eight minutes so we can weigh in on those things. And, uh, and then uh, say one other set of things and I'll stop. And then I'll say a third set of things. Well, let me just say the first will be about um, the stimulus package and where it's going. And, Biden's general successes or not so far. Um, um, the second uh, will be about division and Biden's unity message and what that means in the Congress. And then the third will be about uh, the civil war that's taking place among Republican leadership. So those are my big three themes that, uh, of today, all suggested by our friend Reed. I also want to say hi to Ken Nelson, who was my youngest son's um, baseball coach 35 years ago. So <laughs> Ken and I have both been around for a long time, and he still loves the Mariners too, Sheila. So we're all in the same boat. Um, it's important when we do all this thinking that we remember to sort out carefully what's consequential and what's not consequential. A great example of inconsequential is, of course, uh, Ted Cruz going to Cancun. People love to talk about things like that. And it's obviously a big political or, uh, error by him. But Ted Cruz himself is not a consequential person. He's widely disliked in his own caucus. He's up for election four years from now, as you remember, Beto O'Rourke almost beat him. But he doesn't really have any independent political significance except for the unbelievable fact that his, his that Trump once implied that his father was involved with assassinations or something like that and and uh, Cruz still carries the torch. What's consequential this week is Joe Manchin and that'll be true in a lot of weeks. Joe Manchin from West Virginia was elected as a Democratic senator in a state that gives Trump a 30 percent margin. So, you know, West Virginians, uh, they, uh, he was governor, so they're comfortable with Joe Manchin. And Joe Manchin, because of Trump helping to hand the Democrats the two Georgia Senate seats, all of a sudden, Joe Manchin went from being the 48th vote to the 50th vote, which is hugely important. I was reading on social media the other day, which I should never do, somebody saying, well, it's this 50th vote for the stimulus package, but other than that, Joe Manchin is unimportant. That's not true. George Man Joe Manchin is chair of the Energy Committee, which has a lot to do with climate change. He's monstrously important, and that's not such an awful thing uh, for, for Democrats, even though it seems like it is, for, uh, some people feel it is. At any rate, we're always keeping in mind when Joe Biden needs 50 votes, when he doesn't need any votes, and when he needs 60 votes. So everything we read and think about in terms of what is or is going to happen in D.C. is 
can he do it by diplomacy or executive order or some other administrative move? Does he need 50 votes in the Senate, since he only has 50 votes even with Joe Manchin, with Kamala Harris breaking the tie? Or in the normal order of the Senate, does he need 60 votes to close down a threatened filibuster? So everything we're thinking about in terms of how Joe Biden is going to do depends on that math. So far, to me, it's amazing uh, how much of Donald Trump's four-year uh, agenda that Joe Biden has undone. Uh, that's especially true with certain uh, immigration orders and with environmental policy. And the reason for that is most of those things were accomplished by Donald Trump's executive orders. So Donald Trump also had a hard time getting the 60 votes because there were 45 or so Democrats. So uh, he would, uh, in the situation where you could pass on with 50 votes, which I'll explain further, he would do that, a la the tax bill, the awful tax bill. And then uh, he would do a lot of things, especially environmental policy by executive order. So uh, to make a long story short, um, Biden is reversing those things by executive order. And uh, that's why it seems like a lot of the things from the wall to certain asylum provisions to certain uh, natural resources protections, it seems like uh, Joe Biden is unraveling uh, or joining the Paris Climate Accords. It just seems like oh, Biden is unraveling the age of Trump. And uh, that's, I think, a, a pretty accurate perception, except in areas where executive action is insufficient. So here's three of those. Uh, immigration policy, you can do executive orders as Obama did with Dreamers, but eventually you need 60 votes for us to figure out what we're going to do with the fact that we have 12 billion undocumented uh, folks in the country. Uh, it's also true that for the kind of action on uh, climate change, uh, uh, you, uh, Biden would not be able to get everything he wants done done without eventually getting 60 votes in the Senate. And a third good example, of course, is tax policy. Two or three years ago, we had a massive rewrite of the tax law, and uh, that'll come up again in two or three years, and and uh, and that. Uh, may well or not it might that's possibly well can we can get done with 50 votes but it might uh need 60. so right now uh, there's a huge stimulus stimulus bill you're getting all sorts of media attention to the fact that uh biden's proposal for a 15 an hour minimum wage is not going to be uh successful and that's because there's a rule with regard to this particular 50 vote requirement. This is the budget reconciliation process. And years ago, Robert Byrd of West Virginia wrote the rules for what could be uh, part of budget reconciliation and thus only require 50 votes. And among other things, the rule was that if uh, a matter, uh, if it was a matter where the budget impact was incidental, it would not be subject to the 50 votes. It would need 60. And the parliamentarian has ruled that the impact of the federal minimum wage uh, as a policy on the federal budget is incidental to the broader aims of the bill. That's why uh, if this is not going to be a part of the stimulus package. What is gonna, going to be a part, this, is, this deal has been cut pretty much for a long time. Joe Manchin is already the 50th vote and Kristen Sinema from Arizona, the 49th, and they will get a stimulus package in the $1.4, $1.5 trillion um, range. The reason why this is so, and I'll get it in the next two weeks because the existing unemployment insurance benefits run out. So sometime between March and 15th, this has already been decided. The House is passing it today. Biden's got his 50 votes. Biden's rejected the $600 billion proposal from some Republicans. And this has unemployment insurance extension into August. It has stimulus payments of up to $1,400 to people 
couples who are making up to $200,000 a year. It has an expanded child care tax credit. It's got some money for the states. It's got some rent relief, some food stamp expansion, some COVID assistance. The significance of all this is this will define Biden's first two years. If he gets this, which he will, if COVID gets his 200 million shots or so by early summer, if COVID recedes and by summer we're reopening and there's a feeling of relief in America, it'll set the climate uh, for his first two years and it'll help him in the midterm elections. His poll ratings are over 60%. Republicans are fighting with each other. We still have a divided America, but this is a very significant first step for, for uh, Biden. So I'm gonna stop for a minute. I'm gonna say, as I noted, that it doesn't tell you everything that's gonna happen <laughs> going forward, but it does tell you that Joe Biden is calling Joe Manchin on a weekly basis and they're seeing uh, what uh, what could be worked out, uh, what Joe Manchin can support. Interestingly, in stimulus, Joe Manchin was saying, I don't know, $1,400 is a lot of money. It's certainly getting paid at too high of an income level, which is uh, an interesting issue in itself. Um, and one, I think, which is a close question. Uh, the Republican governor, of West Virginia said, this is not a time to worry about spending too much money. Of course, West Virginia is in a world of problems. So politically, Joe Manchin was never going to uh, vote against the stimulus bill. He was always gonna work it out with Biden. So I'll stop there for a minute. That's what's happening in stimulus. You'll see it passed two weeks from now. It's a big core idea of the Biden presidency. Just like when Obama took over from Bush, as you remember, we were in a recession then too, and they all think that the stimulus bill that they passed with no Republican support then uh, was too small. So they, they want it, and Biden's wanted it for a long time, and he's absolutely going to get it, thanks, of course, to Donald Trump's campaign assistance in Georgia, because uh, it wouldn't be a stimulus bill, anything like this, if Biden had to go find uh, two Republican votes, uh, which like Susan Collins, uh, Lisa Murkowski, uh, that the price for that would have been $600 billion less of, uh, of a stimulus package. Yeah. So let's go with thoughts, concerns, and then I'll go on to what's happening with uh, Biden's message of unity. Uh, you can raise your hand if you have a question. Either at the bottom, raise your hand, or just physically raise your hand if your uh, camera is on, if you have a question right now. I can also move forward if you're just not motivated. I see Tom Kilbane frowning at me for the first <laughs> time in my life. <laughs> hey, so That's what happens when you get your microphone turned off, Tom. That's right. Mine yeah. is on. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that there will be a future action uh, with the uh, minimum wage? Oh, so that's uh, interesting. So Tom might know the number or somebody else on this call. But remember, the minimum wage is the minimum in states. There are some areas of law where when the uh, feds do something, they preempt the state from doing something. That's not true of the minimum wage. So states can vote to exceed that awful $7 a quarter number. And I don't know, 30 or 35 states have done that. Yes. So it, it has no significance in Washington, for instance. But uh, it was a, the other day, John Thune of South Dakota said, well, you know, when I was a boy, I got paid $6 an hour and I was happy to get it. So this $15, well, when he was a boy, that $6 he got, is equivalent to twenty-four dollars now. So, so mm -hmm. let's be careful what uh, with our language. Obviously, there's there's no sustainable employment in this country that can be sustained by seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. Right. So the future for that is they'll try a lower number. 
uh, for the federal uh, minimum wage, they'll try 10 or $12. Yeah. Uh, the battle, and uh, Jeffrey and I were talking about the Evans School, there's some uh, Evans School economists that, that have done minimum wage studies on the big increases here. And uh, I, I myself uh, love the minimum wage, and I think it's one part of a uh, of uh, uh, a strategy to give people living wage jobs. But it is absolutely uh, the case that a lot of the uh, minimum wages are uh, paid to the second wage earner in the family. Mm -hmm. If you were really thinking about how to provide people with food, housing, and health care, $15 isn't going to cut it either, and you would want to work on some kind of living wage strategy. And one way you could do that, of course, is only give out federal and state contracts to contractors who are paying a sustainable wage. At any rate, to make a long story short, there'll be further attempts to try and increase it uh, this year, but it's not the only part of Biden's strategy to uh, help working people and low-income people. Ken, did you have your hand up? I do. I was just curious if um, I've heard the strategy is to hook it to a defense the defense bill that would make it uh, probably a lock in to get through. Do you have a feeling for when the next uh, defense bill might be coming through that they could do that, or do they have to have it stand alone and try to incrementally put it in? There are tactics to add. Uh, things to other things and, uh, and there's the parliamentary rules are can get complicated but as i understand that they just passed the big over trump's objection the big national defense reauthorization two months ago so i don't know which defense bill they would be referring to uh it's complicated to uh uh to uh Basically, that's a showdown, as you know. So you take something that a lot of Republicans want, you put in that poison pill for, not poison pill, that that castor oil for them. They can, if it's something the Democrats want too, all of a sudden you've got Joe Biden is against the defense of America and he's holding us hostage. And those yeah. politics get pretty complicated. Other questions about stimulus? Tom? Tom Kilby? No, oh, you're, you're on mic. I thought maybe you had a question. So, uh, Note that there's $200 billion in here for states. Remember during the campaign, Trump was saying, we don't want to give money to blue states and all that stuff. For years, you have to remember that 49 states constitutionally have to balance their budgets. And the federal government doesn't does does not. So in a time of a recession, you got state governments cutting services to poor people at the same time uh, that jobs are going away and their revenues are 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 going down. So in the olden days, uh, the kind of assistance you wanted from the federal government back in the days of general revenue sharing was counter cyclical support that was available from the federal government to the states during the worst of times. With the politics in DC, we've gotten away from that. So should I go on or do you, are there other questions? On this? I see, anybody else have a question? Nope, it looks like uh, we can move on, David. In my view, uh, there was not another Democratic candidate who was gonna get 81 million votes. And uh, Joe Biden got 81 million votes partly because uh, his message of uh, America working together and unity uh, resonated with uh, a lot of independent voters. And I think um, that's still the case, that uh, he's got uh, polls uh, about favorable ratings about 60%. Uh, uh, but I think uh, we have division in America, of course, is not going to be easily overcome. Part of that is the big lie is still out there. There are Republican senators running around pretending that Donald Trump got more votes than Joe Biden. Last I checked, that was the source of an insurrection that got five people killed. Ron Johnson, the not distinguished senator from Wisconsin, the other day 
just said a lot of the MAGA hats, Make America Great Again hats, that were being worn during the insurrection were new hats that were purchased by Antifa and other people to pretend that they were Trump supporters. This kind of baloney could rip America apart or could cause further terrorist incidents, and it's too bad that it's out there. But there are some signs that the Senate is going to be a little different this time, and quite notably, the ease at which uh, uh, Biden's appointees are getting confirmed. So a lot of attention has been uh, paid to the young woman who, uh, near a tandem who's probably is not going to get confirmed as the head of the Office of Management and Budget. That might be the only appointee to go down. Uh, the, the Congresswoman, uh, Native American Congresswoman from New Mexico that's going to be Secretary of the Interior is going to get confirmed. So it could be Tandon who just spent the last four years doing snarky tweets from the Center for American uh, Progress is going to pay for that. Uh, I think it's less about Tandon, who they, Biden will give another job that doesn't require confirmation. And it's more about if you're a Republican minority and you're letting through uh, all these other appointees and you're confirming them pretty expeditiously, you want to send a signal that you don't have to do that. And she's the unfortunate victim of that. So uh, with Biden going forward, I had predicted or wondered whether there was going to be regular wars between progressives and liberals and moderates in the Democratic Party. And I think you can see what's happening. That fire is not being directed at Biden. Those uh, Congress people, whether they're progressives or liberals, know that Jim, Joe Biden is tied in the Senate and has a 10 vote majority or whatever it is in the House. So you don't see, there's several reasons why you don't see progressives uh, uh, taking out after Joe Biden for being closer to the center than they are. One is he's done a monster amount of things already on climate change. And he's going to on health care. So two big items on the progressive agenda, he will do major work on. He's, he's not going to have a Green New Deal and he's not going to have uh, Medicare for all, but he will make significant progress in those areas. And, and uh, they like that. Uh, he does an enormous amount of uh, uh, background work with uh, members, so it's, he's not above calling, you know, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez to chat things about. But I think mostly they recognize that Biden's the president they've got. I'm not sure, so you're going to see the big progressive liberal wars that break out, at least until the midterm elections. And in the meantime, the wars in the Democratic Party uh, will actually be. Uh, progressives being mad at uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia and Kristen Sinema from Arizona for not being for certain things. And that's a much tamer kind of thing because it doesn't end up wounding the president who those of us who want to win again four years from now would, would like not to wound him. So I'm going to stop for a minute, and then I'll go on to the Civil War uh, in the Republican Party. We have questions, thoughts, concerns about Joe Biden and unity. Well, I, I think that uh, having uh, Bernie Sanders as the budget secretary, I think, was a brilliant move on Biden's part. Or, well, or, he did, I mean, it, part. It, it turned out well for that because it gives Bernie a seat at the table, but it, he didn't choose him as uh, seniority. I mean, yeah, yeah, the seniority, did. and and but uh, you know every time I hear him um, interviewed, he's always very, you know, let's come to the table, work with Biden. It's uh, yeah, and they yeah. and they had a friendship before the mm -hmm. elections that Hillary never had with Bernie Sanders. Right. Uh, right. Speaking of which, as you probably know, incredibly for the since the days we have the strongest uh, power lineup in the Senate probably of any state, and, and uh, as strong as when we had Henry Jackson and Warren Magnuson, Mary Cantwell's the new chair of the Commerce Committee. Yes. And uh, Patty Murray's the new chair of the Health Education 
uh, Labor and Pensions Committee, Help the Help Committee, that's and Pennies and Leadership. This is very significant. And many years ago, actually, right when she started, I worked as a staffer for, uh, policy advisor to Mary Camp for well for a while. And, and uh, this is a, a relentless person, and she's been working on certain ideas since then, and some of which I told her were never going to happen, and several of which will happen under her leadership, which goes what I know. Yeah. Uh, questions about Joe Biden and Democrats and unity? Anybody? Boy, you are just covering everything so well today, David. Oh, I am. You can't, are. can't deny it. What if I was spinning a tale that was not true and misguiding? All of us, that would be bad. I yeah. want to say something about the Civil War. Uh, there's all right, my my uh, own younger son who lives on Bay Bridge is a commentator on political issues too. And uh, over dinner, he's fond of telling me that I'm overstating uh, the Civil War and that it's all kind of the kabuki theater of Republican leadership. I think I'm right and he's wrong. I think three things happened in the last month that are pretty phenomenal. One is Mitch McConnell's excoriation of Donald Trump on the, uh, oh, Christina Mitchell just said Bernie voted against uh, Tom Vilsack, the agriculture secretary, which is a absolutely true and shows that they're not all singing kumbaya every minute. <laughs> There's a lot of progressives that think Vilsack uh, got pushed around by Republicans on poverty and food stamp issues, and that's how that happened. But Vilsack got 85 votes to confirm. Any, anyway, uh, there are three things that happened. First, when you, if you look at Mitch's statement, he wasn't soft touching it. It is absolutely true he didn't vote for impeachment, and he wasn't going to because. This caucus would have thrown him out. But that excoriation was intentional. And I promise you, whatever Mitch says going forward, that Donald Trump does not forget those things. Mitch knew he was estranging himself. He did it deliberately. And Trump will act accordingly. At the same time, weirdly, Nikki Haley also criticized Trump. Now, that is a really unusual thing for her to do because she wants to be president. And you would think that that would not be a good thing to do if you wanted to be the Republican nominee for president. Maybe she had a, a bout of conscience and did it because because there was an insurrection and maybe Republican former governors and UN ambassadors should be against that. Maybe that's why she did it. I don't know why she did it politically, but it puts her in the, to the center from Cruz and Hawley and yeah. even Rubio and all these other people who would go to Mar-a-Lago daily and kiss Trump's ring if he would right. let them show up that often if he wasn't playing golf. So uh, Nikki Haley, uh, after she did that, asked if she could go visit Trump at Mar-a-Lago and he said no. This is very significant. Thirdly, the Wall Street Journal under Rupert Murdoch's ownership said Trump shouldn't run again ever and that he was never going to be president. This sets up the Civil War very nicely. And as you know, for those of us who support the other candidates, it's a good thing. What's going to happen is if you want to run for Senate two years from now with the Senate tied and with Mitch wanting to take the majority back, you got to decide who you love the most. And these candidates will ask for both Mitch's approval and that of Senate leadership and their PAC money and Trump's support and his PAC money. And there'll be 10 states where they can't agree and they'll run somebody who Mitch thinks is less electable, making it more likely that we will win those seats. We have open seats in Pennsylvania, Iowa, uh, Ohio, uh, North Carolina, where retirement's open already been announced we could win all of those we could win wisconsin we're not vulnerable in very many places except georgia where warnock has to run again so it's a it's a interesting time 
for Republicans to be fighting with Republicans. Meanwhile, there's no uh, resolution to what their strategy is because the strategy has been, as you know, suppress the vote, ignore the demographic destiny of America, which is there have the percentage of votes in the overall ballot that come from white males over 30 is the smallest percentage in our history. And it's gonna get smaller. And if your whole strategy is built around white males, some of them angry, that's not an electoral strategy going forward. That's where voter suppression comes in. If that's your strategy, you want everybody who's not a white male to vote less and you want to make it harder to vote rather than easier. Anyway, what's going to, what should we do if we're supporters of the other agenda uh, about uh, all this is keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, this is a permanent campaign. If you're somebody who's involved in calling or postcarding or giving money, you got to keep on doing that. And then secondly, there's 110 voter suppression bills in state legislatures across the country. If you live in Washington, you don't have a problem. We're not passing a voter suppression bill, but keep yourself engaged in what's happening in other states. So those are my three areas to, to cover. And I see there was a question, is that on, I didn't read it on chat. Do you have it there, Karen? Somebody typed a question. Karen? Karen's muted. Oh, there, turn on tap. No? I was coughing and I didn't want you to hear it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Robert and Barbara, uh, uh, Golden, I'm interested in your thoughts on the prospect of non-Trump elected federal Republicans like Nebraska and Alaska senators dropping their affiliations in favor of being independents. By the way, Johnson will lose in Wisconsin next year. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Well, I think it's very interesting. Uh, Ron Johnson hasn't announced that he's running again, but as you know, that's a, that's a state with a Democratic governor, and it's quite possible that Ron Johnson, who's tacked to the right, actually, uh, could lose. So that's an open question along with Ohio, Pennsylvania, Iowa, North Carolina. Uh, with regard to Lisa Murkowski, Republicans in Alaska already hate Lisa Murkowski. So if there's anybody who would might uh, might do something about our party affiliation, it would be her. The problem is you can't get elected as a Democrat in Alaska. So I think what she'll probably do is remain a nominal Republican and win in the center, try to win in the center like she did last time. With Ben Sass in Nebraska, he just ran. So he's got a six-year term. So he'll stay a Republican and insist that the Republicans who are Trump Republicans are wrong, but he'll stay in the party. He's getting censured in Nebraska. It doesn't really matter. He's been elected. And he he, uh, he was elected even after all the snotty things he said about Donald Trump in the last four years, which is a lot. Um, so uh, um, so that's... that's uh, uh, th I was thinking if we got... Uh, 49 votes that Lisa Murkowski might come over and return for a Democratic committee chairmanship. But now that we have 50, there's uh, that happened 30 years ago uh, when Reagan was president, a Republican senator moved to the Democrats and gave them a majority. But at 50-50, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's hard to be, uh, years ago, before I worked for Cantwell, I worked for the Republican governor of Michigan when Ronald Reagan became president. I worked for Bill Milliken. And it is extremely hard to be a Republican governor when you've lost your party to Donald Trump. And that's what Brian Kemp's about to find out in Georgia. Trump will run a primary against him. Uh, as you know, Trump's going to try and defeat Liz Cheney in Wyoming. It's hard to be within that party. And and not genuflect. It's you know, we like to take off on them and say, "Well, where is their conscience?" Uh, as Mark Sanford of North Carolina proved, it's a, a good way to end your political career. So, for those of them who them who still want to have one, uh, it's difficult. I would say, however, there comes a point where 
if you support a candidate who tries to overthrow the United States government, that should be disqualifying to you and to them. So I think we've got to elect more. This is preposterous. Post January 6th, there's no longer any excuse for, for this, and, and they know it. All right. Hey, Reed, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering about people like uh, um, uh, the um, Jamie um, Herrera Butler, Butler. No, uh, Butler. Butler and uh, and the and the fellow in um, Okanagan County, both of who, um, let's see, his name's Dan Newhouse. Yeah. Uh, both, both of them who uh, who have been censured in Washington State uh, as Republicans who supported impeachment going forward. Uh, do they are there? Is there calculus that that the tide is going to turn or? Um, or they, or do you think they were? It was just a matter of consciousness, and they're willing to uh, lose their seats if need be. So there's ten Republicans who voted for the bill of impeachment. Two of them are ours, and only one of the two was anticipated. Jamie Herrera Butler. A lot of us uh, were very interested in that race and tried to beat her. With Carolyn Long, who was an excellent candidate who had gotten 46 percent two years ago, worked her tail off and got 46 percent this time. That's because Jamie Herrera Butler has permanent support in the center. So that's Clark County and environs. And she can win in the center. And in fact, if she runs again, which I think she will, she will win in the center. Uh, that is, there are, are, there are, Carolyn Long came out and commended her the other day. There are a lot of Trump voters in that district, but, uh, what she's done by doing that with Trump is she's there's, there's not going to be a strong Republican Democratic candidate against her. So she'll win in the center and she'll be fine. Dan Newhouse is from Sunnyside. He's got 600 acres of hops. And if you had told me in advance that he was going to vote against Trump, I would not have believed it. That's nothing but somebody looking in the mirror and saying they can't bear it anymore. There is no political advantage to Dan Newhouse to do that. It's likely to get him a primary. It could be that he's just not running again. He's he's our age, so maybe he's tired of all this stuff. But uh, 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 that was a courage vote. And uh, Trump won his district by 25 percentage points. So there, there, he's not feeling a lot of love right now. Yeah. So he maybe take care of his hops. What? He wants to retire and take care of his hops. That's right. Or benefit from the use of the hops for products. <laughs> hey, uh, Sheila, you have a question. Unmute yourself. I keep forgetting. Um, I yeah, I know. Whatever. Uh, uh, David, what do you know about the um, possibility of another insurrection uh, coming along on March 4th. I just, I, I, mean, I, I could see, I don't know anything about it. I haven't, haven't been informed. I haven't gotten the memo yet, but um, I think uh, the Capitol didn't need to be breached the last time. I think we're capable of as long as we have intelligence about demonstrations of keeping our buildings from being breached. And we were capable on January 6th, we just didn't. So I'm, I think the support, especially with 200 arrests, the support for a mass violent action is probably thin, if anything. I think people do not like to spend time in prison. It's very uncomfortable and they do not choose it. And I don't think there's very many Trumpites who believe that such an insurrection would be uh, successful. They're trying though. They, uh, Trump has been on the super right wing uh, media's last this past week and he's one of the keynote you know, speakers at CPAC this weekend. And, uh, and of course he is still uh, professing that he was, he still won the election. And yeah. You know, CPAC didn't send the rioters, but uh, yeah. it is true that people are not only letting him, but abetting him to mm -hmm. reinforce.
course, the great lie again and again. That never goes well because eventually, I mean, well, I think in history, there are a lot of people after uh, Germany surrendered World War I, took a lot of the German public by surprise. They didn't think the war was going well, but they didn't think it was going surrender type badly. And Hitler used that uh, as his argument against the, um, the ruling class. So I think it's a bad idea to, uh, to let th things like, I, I think Republican leadership should be saying every day, yes, Joe Biden was legitimately elected. No, Donald Trump's claims are not, are not factual. Um, I agree. Hey, Laura B. Uh, asked, what do you think about McConnell's latest statement indicating he'd support Trump in 2024? Good question. I, I think it's meaningless. I, I mean, I think it was incredible and preposterous and amazing and Alice in Wonderland-like, but I don't think it has any practical significance. It's not going to make Trump any happier with with Mitch. He hates Mitch. Mitch hates him. They'll continue to hate each other. Uh, there might be some political theater less than that, but there'll be at least 10 candidates in two years from now where Mitch will support one in the primary and Trump will support the other, which will be nice. There's no question about which of the two has greater rank in file support, uh, the, and that's Trump. Now, remember, with any amount of felonies he could be convicted of in the next four years, that's not inconsequential. And remember also that this is a, an America of great disclosures. So 500 people who were in D.C. these last four years have a secret. We'll just see how many of them will tell the secret. Joe Biden just released the Saudi Arabia report that the Saudi. Yes. So the Biden administration might release some secrets, but you know there's some deputy assistant secretary who of this or that was it, who was in a meeting with Donald Trump when Donald Trump uh, urged uh, South American leaders to let him invade Venezuela. So um, you just know that some of that's going to come out. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Bonnie, do you have a question? This kind, David just kind of hit on it, but I was thinking the the uh, income tax things are uh, are in New York now, and I, I, the the possibility of these trials that could affect Trump. Do you think any of these um, things, as they accumulate, would affect? Uh, in a positive way of people turning against him? Is there anything that could be said that would turn these these fanatics against him? Um, you know, there's been a lot of reporting that makes us think uh, uh, that the same people support him as did four years ago. And there must be a lot because he got 74 million votes. Um, Unless, of course, those were fraudulent votes. <laughs> um, the, uh, so there's some support out there, but there's some data out there now on people walking away from the Republican registrations in states. As you know, in Washington, we don't register by party. Right. But there's quite a, there's a considerable uh, 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 movement away by party registration. And some by some polls, some drop maybe permanent drop into the 36, 30% 30 approval range. So I think uh, the three major areas of potential threat, threats of litigation are all considerable. Letitia James is the Attorney General of New York. Most notably, uh, Cy Vance Jr., who is Manhattan District Attorney, who was just given access to Trump's taxes by the U.S. Supreme Court. And then the sleeper, the Arizona, the Fulton County uh, prosecutor in Georgia, who's thinking of charging him with election tampering. So I think uh, between disclosures and lawsuits, you you would you could see some real fading. That wouldn't mean a deliberate, consequential, huge, monumental consensus to move away from him, but it would be a further deterioration of his influence. 
John Storch just said, uh, yeah. you might fade away. I mean, he's, he's, he's not a, a young man and he's not uh, physically fit. So, I mean, I think there's a good argument that Donald Trump, Donald Trump doesn't want to be president again. There's a great argument he didn't want to be president the first time, uh, but that he certainly doesn't want again. What he wants is love every day of the year. This is definitely definitely a wounded soul. Too bad he was president. Was there more to John's question? Is, is that, did I catch it? Well, let's see. Um, no, you, you covered it, David. Thank you. You covered it. Okay. Read Price. Read Price, um, says, Reed Price says, and no one can inherit his base. I think that's right. I think all this talk about Laura Trump and Ivanka is baloney. I don't think anybody in, in uh, the Trump base cares about anything about any of those people. I think they're just people. I think uh, it's Donald Trump inexplicably that has the magic. Who knew? Yeah. It's unbelievable <laughs> if that we ever came to this. I think. You know, Joe Biden said the other day, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump. I don't know what press conference it was. And it has been a relief uh, to not have him tweet daily. The reason why activists have to talk about Donald Trump is that he's still a threat to us. You, we talk about all that Biden's accomplished. We're not going to accomplish those things if we have 45 senators. Right. So we have to. Uh, we don't have to be obsessed with Trump, but we have to be obsessed with continuing to win. And that actually is our biggest issue. We were able to get turnout that was monumental in 2018 because we were two years into Trump and that was our organizing tool. We got 81 million votes for Biden because we turned out every demographic we needed to turn out. People say, well, we didn't get Latinos. We had 65% of Latinos. We just didn't get Latinos so much in Dade County where we wanted them. So uh, the question is two years from now, all that monumental voting under fire from voter people who are doing voter suppression, uh, are we gonna be able to get turnout off year a year and a half from now, and that will be a big question because Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Iowa, was, um, North Carolina, those are turnout races. You run a good candidate, and that gets you up to about 47%. You run a good candidate, and you have great turnout that gets you to 51 Right. Hey, Tom, you have another question? Uh, I, I, this is my first one, Carol. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, given uh, Jim Jordan from Ohio, you know, made a statement that Trump yeah. is the leader of the party, and the comments, uh, you know, on the uh, internet were, "How can you call a man that lost the presidency, the Senate, and the House the leader? Why would you follow him?" Now that that's obviously, you know, logical argument. Do you think that will? get legs with the Republicans as they go along? They want no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But um, remember when we lost uh, in 16, uh, we had, and back when George Bush was president too, figuring out who is the leader of your party when you don't have the presidency is interesting because they select for majority leader and sometimes speaker of the house people who are not good spokespeople for your party. So I thought Harry Reid was not, and I think Schumer is just okay. So when you don't have the presidency, who is your leader? Uh, so it wasn't for us uh, when we were out of power, it wasn't Pop Perez who was chair of the party. We just didn't really have a leader. The person you were most likely to see on TV was uh, Pelosi, or, who I think has done a credible job, and Schumer. I think they have that issue times 10. So first, they don't have a natural leader without him. And secondly, they pay the price for anybody suggesting that he's not the leader. So that otherwise, that would be a good argument. They've lost those three things. But they did just take back eight, ten or house, eight or 10 House seats. They did get 74 million votes. and. Most importantly, anyone who suggests that he's not the leader 
pays a price within their own state parties. Yeah. They get censured. I'll tell you a quick story about uh, Reed. This is probably 30 years ago, at least. He was uh, on a committee that I, I, you know, I was lobbying and I had sent him a check and it was a, probably a hundred dollar check. And the election occurred, he, you know, he won easily. And he sent the check back. He said, thanks a lot, but I, I had more than I needed. I didn't need it. Can you imagine you, you ever heard of a politician sending a check back? No. Nope. I asked, I asked uh, Ray Cantwell once why Harry Reid, because I didn't think he was such a great spokesman. She says, he individually attends to the political, he understands the political situation and needs of each member of our caucus. So that's, and that's Schumer with regard to Joe Manchin. You don't find Schumer, you know, taking off on, on Joe Manchin for the same reason. It's a problem, however, for the party that needs to be led. Somebody was saying, you know, what a great job on yesterday's uh, Tracy Stacy Abrams Zoom that Cory Booker did. There's no play. There's no room for an especially articulate senator who's not Amy Klobuchar. You think there'd be some way that when we don't have the presidency, that people like that could get a big enough following to be seen as a party leader? But it's 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 hard. Right. Uh, Sheila. Yeah. A very specific question. What do we do with Jim Jordan? Mm. <laughs> does, he, does he get going up in the wrestling thing? Maybe. Uh, no, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think Jim Jordan. I think this is uh, electorate in his district knows him. He did say he's not running for Rob uh, Portman's uh, Senate seat. So that uh, Jeffrey was your question. Uh, polarization has grown over twenty years, or I, I only saw the first part of it. Yeah, I'll read. Pew research, so Pew research polling has shown increasing polarization across mm -hmm. the United States since the 90s. This is not news to anyone. And there's a lot of talk about the continued existence of Trumpism, which we'll just call right-wing populism or just anti-liberalism as, as a label. Do you think Joe Biden's unity messaging governing is the beginning of a prolonged movement towards a, a re-centralization of American politics? Is a movement to the left or is itself an aberration driven by animus towards Donald Trump and also COVID-19 and a cratering economy? Mm. Wow. What an outstanding, it makes me proud to have taught that to have in school. What a great question. I think it's a piece of all three, don't you think? That is, so first, uh, we're more polarized for a couple reasons that have been mentioned in this discussion. I buy that we are. I think social media, uh, you monetize your app by getting activity that you're going to be more likely to get if you have eyeballs, which you're more likely to get if you're incendiary. So I think uh, social media uh, exaggerates uh, uh, differences. Um, and I think uh, so does uh, gerrymandering. The Democrats have done too. I think uh, rather than when I was Growing up years ago, there were 80 seats being contested, and now it's more like 40 or 50 because Democrats and Republicans, partly because they've done trade-offs. I think Joe Biden uh, is not an aberration politically. I think his stripe, which is uh, as a, um, a, a longtime liberal, is a common Democratic stripe. But I don't think it was automatic for anybody, Kamala Harris, Booker, or Klobuchar, or somebody might emerge, no longer going to be Andrew Cuomo for sure. Um, I don't think it's obvious that that's replicable, that somebody can seize that plan. So I think that's, that's interesting. I think the Democrats will need to, to uh, remake it. But I do think uh, that rather than a permanent change, I think that you will see as we go out of COVID a uh, reduction in the incredible social turmoil that we have had. And the, the big question will be, 
can we sustain that reduction post Biden? He's 77, 78 years old. We're going to have to figure out as Trump and Biden pass from the scene, who could be a leader like we used to fall, somebody we used to fall in behind who could get 65% their whole uh, time in office. Sorry about the wandering answer. I think it's a bit of all of the above. I think time will tell. I do not, I absolutely do not think there's anything about Biden's unity call that uh, is lasting. I think we'll have to learn, earn the lasting part of it just because so much of his unity dealings in D.C. now are personal relationships with people. He's known Lindsey Graham for 40 years. That's a bad example because Lindsey Graham to outrageous, but he's known Mitch for a long time and that I think he's trading on relationships that other potential Democratic leaders do not have. Yeah. I am extremely worried about uh, social media. I'll be back uh, on March 26th and again in April, and we can have this as an ongoing discussion. A lot of you have been with me before. And uh, let's just all evaluate these things and see what we can figure out. I think America is in a better place. If you are wondering and worried about America, just think how how you would feel if, if we were in the second month of Trump's second term. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there's a lot to hope for. Remember that so much of our anxiety is related to the to uh, the the pandemic. And uh, back to Jeffrey's thoughts, if the pandemic is behind us and there is an associated recovery, we might have a little good feeling for a while just on those fronts. Yeah. Um, the rest of it would be what part of Biden's agenda do Republicans secretly agree with? It's not a lot. I'd be very interested in seeing some Republican votes on a solution for immigration. And what they do agree with, there's a lot of that Republican leadership that are globalists in the very much in the Biden form. So they like him running around NATO and WHO and the UN and so forth. So that's that's a good place to get Republican support.